everyone. We wanted to announce our project, gradhacker.org. It's a collaborative blog for grad students, by grad students. All of our contributing authors are in a grad program, whether that be a master's program, a PhD program, um, law school, med school, technical program. And we're taken, or our authors all come from a variety of institutions, a variety of different disciplines, and we're all writing about hacking grad school in the broadest sense of the term. So hacking as in new technology to make writing a dissertation easier. Hacking as in healthy recipes because we don't have the time or money to make healthy food. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we just we wanted to come to that camp and really grab other grads. Um, we launched the site. We've had a lot of success. Um, we have sort of a diversity of authors right now, but we want to get greater diversity of authors, especially outside of the Midwest. Um, so make sure you come to the grad hacking session that's immediately after lunch. If you're a grad student and you're here at that camp, you should be at that session. So please, please, please come to the session. Also, if you're not a grad student, we'd really appreciate it if you would spread the word to your other grad students in your departments. Um, we, even if they don't want to write, we want to see people in the web site. So. And while it is a site for grad students, what we really want is comments from non-grad students, so administrators and faculty and just anybody who's dealing with grad students, any advice from people who are out of grad school. like commenting on somebody's story of, well, I'm parent, a parent and I'm in grad school, and have somebody say, like, well, this worked really well for me, <coughs> this didn't. So we really do want to get this a wider community involved in the website. We also have to say a thank you to Prof Hacker. We are yeah. sort of modeling ourselves after that model, but we're doing mm -hmm. different things as well. Um, so please, like, just pop on the site and read some of the stories to get a feel for what we're talking about. And then, you know, if that, if that strikes you as, oh, I know somebody who would have a valuable voice in that conversation, please, please send that email or have that conversation and get them. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, quick other brief note about uh, dork shorts as a format. Often I want to ask questions and whatever, but we really don't have the time. Um, so ask those on Twitter or um, we'll keep the left half. Much more. Hmm. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Jack Doherty from Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. Shana Kimball from the University of Michigan Libraries and Publishing Division. We're collaborating on a publication that may interest you, the content as well as the format. Writing History in the Digital Age is a born digital open review edited volume that we're constructing under advanced contract with the University of Michigan Press. So what's the story? Edited volumes sometimes have, as we say, uneven quality. Sometimes the chapters were written in isolation from one another, and it would have been better if people had talked ahead of time. So what are we doing on our site? It's a way to get people who are thinking about contributing essays during the month of June to post their ideas on a comment press-like site, like Media Comments Press, and to talk about their topics, their ideas, their discussion back and forth, to share ideas. We move ideas onto the main board, Essays are due later in the summer, August 15th, and this helps us to get ready for our open review, open peer review with invited experts in the fall. Jane, tell you more about the University of Michigan Press arrangement. Yeah, so Digital Culture Books um, is an imprint of the University of Michigan Press. Um, we developed it in collaboration with the library, which is where I work. Um, we now have 24 titles in the imprint. Um, they are in the fields of new media studies and digital humanities. I'll show you some of our forthcoming titles. Um, <coughs> of titles that are you know, sort of of interest to this audience. Um, <coughs> we just published uh, Digital Rubbish, and National History of Electronics. I heard some people talk about hardware earlier today. The American Scho Literature Scholar in the Digital Age. These are two of our newest publications. We're really interested in, um, I, would, I should say, all of the books in this imprint are published online, open access, as well as for sale. Imprint, um, we're really interested in collaborating with authors who are um, wanting to develop um, open participatory social models of publishing. So please, if you have a, an idea, please come talk to me. And our sticker is on this bag. There's three bags of these pumpkin chocolate chip cookies. Let the bake off begin. Pass it along. Davila. Yes. Up next. Yay. I like the. I like the.
That's all. So, um, my name is June Bauer, and this is <coughs> mostly for, this is a tool I developed to help um, basically programmers, and in particular uh, database designers. So, you project or any other kind of humanities project and then you have to explain what you have done to the other people in your project who do not think in the boxes and arrows that you think in because you are a database designer so what I've done is created a project and it will take it will put take your it pulls in your, your database schema and a very simple um, CSV file that you create that will, um, you, where you can, you know, modular struct, what, what, what entities go in what modules, what um, annotations you want to do, and then it puts it out in a little uh, force-directed diagram. It's interactive, I swear. The mouse isn't working. Um, there we go. So you can pull up different things and you can have a little annotation and it'll show you all the different um, keys, primary keys, foreign keys, how it relates. You can move things around. You can shrink entire modules some days. Um, and you can show things in iSpace. I don't know why this isn't. Okay, something's not working. <coughs> Um, but you can, the idea is to help you easily create color-coded, annotated, interactive diagrams of your database, basically humanist readable documentation. Um, so if you are interested, the website is genebauer.com slash davila or just find the person with curly hair. Yay. <laughs> I will, we will begin in two minutes when, you, when your website, if any, has loaded. I think that's a slash Dorn. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, by the way, whoever turned off the light, please turn it on. Keep it on. Okay. Hello. I am introducing <coughs> for playtesting the adventures of Altac Pomo. You played the magic, the gathering, thought it was completely unconnected to your life. <laughs> and you were pissed that you had to buy cards. Here, this game, it's another dueling card game, except you get to make your own cards. Okay? So. Oh, yes. Um, the rules are online, so I'm not going to explain everything, except I have seven starter sets. You can have one of the original Altac Homo starter sets. <laughs> the entire game is CC by BY. Um, you can declare what license, if any, you want your cards are. And you can come to me and borrow washable markers or colored sparkly pens. <laughs> the other game, by the way, you can blame the folks at that camp southeast for turning to the dark, for turning me to the dark side. <laughs> is GSBS. <laughs> Somehow, I have found that everyone understands precisely what that is. All you need from me is this, in case you are not a die-hard gamer and have dice anyway. So, if you want to play test either of these games, come see me. Right now, there are only seven <laughs> starter packs of this. I have already given away one die, Play it, comment, both of these games, they're CCBY, so make them your own, hack them, make money off of them, whatever. Thank you. If we have a die rolling app on our iPhone, can we use that? <laughs> whatever. So 
just want to show a project that um, has been completed. Uh, I'm, at, I'm from the Barton Graduate Center in New York City. And uh, we had a two semester project that students were working on creating a digital exhibition on the material culture of New York City. And the, the project that initially started out as um, going to the New York Public Library, looking at their public domain objects, and then pushing them into the digitization process that they have at the NYPL to turn maps and other objects into digital format. Um, and we were thinking initially of using an Omeka site for the students committed to creating the full HTML site, which um, we ended up creating over the course of 68 weeks. So there are five sub-sites um, that you can look at. One is on uh, streetcar vendors in New York City. Another one is uh, on uh, different maps and views and the way that maps represent um, different time periods and how you can track the development of building and different spaces in New York City based on, for instance, the fire insurance maps, which are prevalent at the New York Public Library. Um, there's another project on Central Park. Um, and a lot of these images have uh, dynamic zoomifying capabilities um, within the site. <coughs> so you can get a very, those are flash block on. Oh, there we go. Um, so you can get very detailed looks into the objects themselves from the collection. So there's a lot of kind of dynamic investigation of those materials. And so this was a student project. Um, we're really thinking about how to push our exhibition practice at the Bard Graduate Center into the digital age and what is the difference between a digital online experience versus the physical presence that we have in our gallery spaces. So I wanted to show this to everyone to hear feedback, other projects that you're working on interested in. This is something that's part of our, like I said, our exhibition design, but also our curricular investigation. And uh, we found a lot of interesting solutions we'd like to share and we'd like to hear more from people. So. So the Ethnographic Research in Illinois Academic Libraries was a two-year project involving five universities um, in Illinois um, doing an, an ethnographic analysis of how students um, conduct research and find information they need uh, in the libraries. Um, so this involved uh, librarians at uh, all five of these universities uh, collecting um, information about students through nine different methodologies. Um, and these are all outlined on the website. I, I can't obviously get into results uh, much here. This project was uh, completed in 2010, so uh, a lot of our research results are already on the website uh, for you to check out. Uh, that's actually all I have to say. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> delicious cookies that we, okay. <laughs> These are actually writing mysteries cookies, but uh, for yet, the federal government, we will concentrate yes. them. And, 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 and because we don't want to compete in the bake off, we did bring our own chocolate, though, that we will share with everyone as well. So I will start this over here. Because anytime you visit the Office of Digital Humanities as a panelist, as a visitor, it's just to, to drop by, you'll notice an enormous bowl of chocolate in the middle of the table, as many of you can attest. So. Hi. Um, we have money. Not as much as maybe we'd like, but we have money. And we want to give you money. Um, just so you know, we fund all kinds of digital projects. And a lot of the projects that I've even seen here or that I've heard about could be competitive at any age. Um, everything from online archives, uh, collaborative research projects, uh, online exhibits, websites of all kinds for public audiences, for educational audiences training institutes, online encyclopedias, <laughs> annotations of uh, scholarly annotations, all kinds of stuff. Um, so I wanted to just introduce myself, this way you know me and Jen. Um, speak to us. A lot of times people are intimidated by NEH. Um, a lot of times people us. aren't. You shouldn't be. Um, we have our little offices. They get kind of quiet. We like speaking to people. Old technology. I have paper here. I also use old landlines, call me, 202-606-8308.
That's 202-606-8308. Operators are there 24 hours a day, and you get a Ginsu knife if you. Um, and also, um, for those of you who are more electronically motivated, D Weinstein, D W E I N S T E I N, at neh.gov. And if you just have an idea, feel free to call. And Jen is in the Office of Digital Humanities, and she'll tell you maybe a bit more about what they do and give you her contact information. So we're known um, for doing things like the Digital Humanities Startup Grant Program, the Institutes for Advanced Topics in Digital Humanities. Um, so follow me on at Jen Cerventi uh, on Twitter or at NEH underscore ODH on Twitter. But to echo David, call us, talk to us. We answer our own phones. We answer all of our emails. <laughs> Eventually, if you're waiting for an answer from me, I'll get to it soon. I promise. And I'm in the Division of Public Programs. I probably should have said that. And we'll find you the right program. Yes. Thank you. Okay, this is not uh, the official site, but it's something I just threw up here so you, that you can see that. Uh, I'm Mark Sample, and I <laughs> uh, so I'm working on a book project I thought some people might be interested in. The book project's uh, pretty cool in two different ways. One of the ways is how we're writing it. We have uh, nine or ten different authors. We're writing it as a single voice on a wiki, or we're using a wiki, and we're all editing each other's work. It's not individual chapters by individual authors. So it's really kind of a, a crowd-written book. And the other thing about the book is uh, the subject matter. Up there, tin print, character, blah, blah, blah. This is a one-line program for the Commodore 64 that when you run it will create this continuously uh, randomly generated maze on the Commodore 64. And we're writing about this one-line program. Um, we're looking at it from a kind of code studies point of view. We're looking at it as what mazes the role in computer culture and games. We're looking at the role of randomness and how randomness was uh, in computing has a strong connection to the Cold War, to uh, <coughs> the development of the hydrogen bomb. There are all these kind of connections between war and computers that we're looking at. Um, we're looking at the platform of the Commodore 64 and Commodore 64, uh, their peculiar version of BASIC. We're also looking at just BASIC and home computing uh, in the early 80s and late 70s. Um, it's the Various people on the book, Nick Montfort, Ian Bagos, me, uh, Casey Reese, who was the co-designer, a, a co-creator of processing, computer language, many people know. Um, Jeremy Douglas, Patsy Bowden, just uh, 10 of us or so writing this book. And when it comes out, it will be on MIT Press in their software study series. And it should be pretty interesting. And that's it. Trevor, I work at the Library of Congress. Um, I just need to remember a URL so I won't talk while I type. <coughs> so some folks here were at um, did a workshop on this yesterday. Uh, it's a fully functioning piece of software we've, we've built that I'm um, happy to create an account for anyone who wants to use it. I think I just tweeted the link to the, the thing I was using for the, the examples here. This is an example of what you build with recollection, um, sort of like a dynamic interface to cultural heritage materials, in this case a set of postcards about Northern Virginia. If you're looking for a place to visit while you're here, Gunston Hall is quite beautiful. Um, you get faster browsing. If you're familiar with this, this is more or less a um, simile exhibit that we're using. What recollection does is it creates a very easy to use interface where you can just upload spreadsheets of data and actually get some sort of automatic processing things on them to get lat longs for things to put on maps. Um, it will work with spreadsheet data, it works with mods records, it soon will work with OAI PMH. Um, so it's sort of very much tailored to creating interfaces to cultural heritage collections. You also get the ability to, for anyone who's using this to export the info. So in this case, this is tab, <coughs> you could export it as XML. 
and these are ultimately embeddable. So um, it's a one line code that you can then embed in your own site and actually style locally. So you use this to build an interface to your collection and then um, other people can actually build interfaces to your collections too, which is kind of neat. But then it lives on your own site and um, we're working on it. We'd love to get more feedback from you about uh, the tool. So I'll pull up one more example really quick because it looks like I have like an extra second. I'm gonna wait until I get yelled off. <laughs> um, so here's an example that was actually made from a set of mods records. So these are mods records from American Memory. And in this case, we just uploaded the 128 um, items in this set and geolocated them based on fields that were there. The pins, if you're interested, are the mediums on which they were in there, so if you're in the 12-inch acetate discs, you know which ones were okay. those. Oh, I'm hey done. done. So I'm here to, <clears throat> I'm Mark Tabot. I tweet as Urban Humanist, and I'm here to tell you about Cleveland Historical. Um, through uh, Cleveland Historical, my colleagues and I at the Center for Public History and Digital Humanities curate the city, and here's the, the web <coughs> version of the project. It's an instance of a larger initiative we're calling Mobile Historical for lack of a better name. What's great about Mobile Historical is that it, it's essentially a mobile publishing tool for, uh, for a full range of libraries, archives, heritage, tourism communities, uh, and scholars, but it's built on top of Omeka. It allows you uh, to publish um, material to an iOS, to an Android, it has mobile style sheets, and of course a really cool looking website. Um, uh, it's a lot, we essentially geolocated stories and multimedia content uh, onto a map. We have a, a level of a meta interpretation that includes tours and it also includes you know, full social media. Um, it's scalable and extensible beyond Cleveland. We're actually, uh, so mobile historical is available to any city or co museum collection, essentially. We're opening uh, Spokane Historical in a few weeks with Larry Sebula, uh, collaborating with him, and we're also beginning to talk to extend it to other cities and museums around the country. Uh, we'll be working with center, our posts here, the Center for History and the Media, to release a version that'll be compatible with Omeka.net. Uh, and then we're working towards an open source version. So if you see me, ask for a postcard. It'll take you to our site. You can put it on your iPhone or your Android. Um, and we're also seeking partners who might be interested in working with us to uh, test the extensibility and to be beta testers for the early versions. Um, and I'd also just love to hear your general impressions, thoughts, and advice. And I have eight seconds left, and I see my time. <laughs> Hard. Thank you. He's an anthropologist. So. Um, all right. So an archaeology field school is something that's that's very important in archaeology. All undergraduates do it. Essentially, it is how undergraduates learn to be archaeologists. They go to a site, they dig for five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, fifteen, twenty-five weeks, um, and basically learn to be an archaeologist. So what I've actually done is I've co-opted that idea um, with the Cultural Heritage Informatics Field School. It's basically it's running right now. Um, they, uh, students from uh, uh, anthropology, history, library sciences, writing, library, <laughs> cultural studies, whatever, anyone who's interested in heritage comes together for five weeks, um, nine to four every day, five days a week, to basically learn how to build cultural heritage informatics user experiences, applications, you know, whatnot. Um, and each week we have these rapid development projects. And then we're going to have a, uh, a really large project at the end that everyone is collaborating on. Uh, very much embodies this sort of hacking as a way of knowing, building as a way of knowing. Um, they're going to learn about lots of different platforms, code, project management, user-centered design, user experience design, 
all that kind of good stuff, then the idea is they come out of this with a really good foundation about how they can apply these to their domains or their collections or their experiences or anything like that. And like all my classes, um, it is, it is uh, outward facing. Uh, so you can actually watch everything we're doing. Um, you can take a look at what the students are doing. All, all the rapid development projects are actually going to go up on the, on the site itself. Um, uh, hopefully, this is the first time we're doing this, so hopefully this is something that we're going to do in, in years to come. Um, and it's not only intended for students, but it's also intended for professionals as well. So museum people, cultural resource management, uh, anything like that. So follow along, um, and I have no seconds left. So thank you. <laughs> Yay. was funded with a, a small grant. Uh, it's a collaboration between myself, an instructor in public history, Dr. Betsy Nix, and the folks in our information services uh, department who will be eventually responsible for curating mobile apps that our undergraduate and graduate students are creating collaboratively across departments. So the idea is that they're designing interactive educational experiences around public history research that they're originally creating and in doing so building templates that can be used in the future for undergraduate students to release experiences optimized for the mobile platform. So we're in the early stages of this. Uh, the first three apps will be released in uh, August or September depending upon uh, the iStore's approval system and then we'll be moving across devices. But we're especially interested in talking to people who are thinking about ways that, to make undergraduate research more, more meaningful and publicly accessible. And also to get students who are in more technical fields involved in, in thinking about uh, educational relationships with other students as, as their clients and as content experts. So we're particularly, yeah. Yeah, I just lost my wireless connection on the uh, <laughs> on my iPad, so that's not gonna work. But we're currently prototyping around the artists of the folks such as uh, Duke Riley, the Carolina Chocolate Drops, and other folks who we've uh, made agreements with so that we can take a look at how artists are creating things that interact with that history and get our students involved in making that accessible to audiences that normally don't relate to these sorts of materials. I'd really like to talk to anyone else who'd like to get involved so we can expand this beyond our institution and get a larger range of these apps built together as a collaborative educational resource. experience for 16 year olds around the world. Um, it's a quarter long course that we've co-taught um, three times now this year. Um, and uh, so I don't know, I guess I just, I'm interested in presenting it because I think there, I, there are interesting, interesting projects going on in K-12 spaces that I think this community is maybe not as aware of. Um, so just kind of wanted to present this as one possible example of what that could look like. Um, we've done a lot of digital ethnography work with them, um, asked kids through cultural probes activities to document the things that they eat, the things that they buy, um, and this kind of thing. So to also, to reflect on their own work, <coughs> their own lives, as well as to look at um, the experiences of others. So our kids have Skyped with kids in England, um, in central Washington state, um, in Utah, in Australia, kind of those spaces. Um, our syllabus, readings, and projects were inspired by um, syllabi that I read um, that some of you may have 
written. Um, so by undergrad courses. Um, so anyway, just wanted to share that. Thanks. of South Carolina Upstate in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and I'm an undergraduate computer information system student, and I was awarded a grant from the USC system to develop uh, flexiblefutures.org and some plugins, <coughs> uh, accessibility plugins for WordPress and Omega. Mm -hmm. So um, over the past few months, and actually uh, the Omega plugins dating back to almost a year ago, um, developing uh, plugins that allow website administrators to create uh, access keys. Um, so for instance, if you're on an Omeka installation and want to go to the search page, you can just hit control S on your keyboard. And this is great for individuals who are visually impaired who navigate using the keyboard. And then we also have a plugin called TechZoom, which allows um, users going to the website to uh, blow up the text on the screen so that they can see it um, in a larger font. And it also remembers their settings for up to 30 days. Right now, um, on the website, we have uh, the WordPress Access Keys plugin available uh, for download. Right now, we've had almost 100, 100 well, over 100 downloads. On it. I think it was approaching 150 the last time I looked. Mm -hmm. um, and this website is just a place for us to share our developments uh, with accessibility tools and resources. We have a blog um, and uh, forums and uh, all the code that's up there is open sourced and available on GitHub. Um, so we're really looking for uh, developers to sort of expand uh, what we're developing and uh, you know, to help us grow accessible futures to make the world more accessible. So thank you. <laughs> so I'm Patrick Lemieux. I'm a PhD in art, art history and visual studies at Duke. And I'm working on this project at noplace.org with Jack Center from the University of Florida. This is a project called Open House. And it's a piece of software for telematically squatting a distressed home in Gainesville, Florida. The software is installed both online and in Gainesville. And if you download the application, you can see and interact with real-time video streaming from the house. This is a video of this, of course. And if you kind of push on elements of the house, um, it's networked, and so you'll see them open and close in real-time in Gainesville <laughs> as you operate it through the network. And so this is a project about visualizing the effects of the housing collapse through the network and making that material, uh, making that uh, kind of materially visible in Gainesville. And today's a really great day actually to download this and try it out because the squatters living in the house are having a yard sale. Um, and so you can see them kind of moving around in the front yard and even you can help them open, you know, open the door for them as they're moving stuff in and out. <laughs> Unfortunately, in their uh, activities, they did break the interior camera, so the inside looks a little wonky, but Jack should be over there later today to fix it. So download it, check it out, and it's also going to be at SIGGRAPH this summer in Vancouver, so if you're there, uh, come talk to me. We're gonna have it installed with an actual threshold that you can walk through bodily, which will create those effects in the house. So, thank you. Oh dear. <laughs> I'm back. You again. Yeah, me again. Uh, so who's familiar with Play the Past? Okay, so that's what I would like. All right, so Play the Past is, um, it's a uh, collaboratively authored and edited blog, very much in the, in the tradition of uh, Prop Hacker, no great surprise there, um, that explores the, um, the issue of uh, cultural heritage of games and cultural heritage in games. Um, 
We do two um, <coughs> articles uh, per uh, week, and we have um, authors that are drawn from a wide variety of disciplines and backgrounds, archaeologists, ancient historians, classicists, historians, um, uh, English media, media studies. Mark and Trevor, put your hands up. There's two of our stunning, stunning authors. <laughs> they put out wonderful content all the time. Um, we've also got lots of um, uh, 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 guest authors. So if you're interested in writing about uh, cultural heritage of games or cultural heritage in games, broadly defined, um, come and talk to me or send me an email or at me at Captain Primate. Um, uh, and if you're interested in reading about it, uh, check out the uh, site. Really fast. So uh, I'm going to see if a uh, drug short can be a cure for fear, self-doubt, insecurity, and procrastination. I uh, blog and <coughs> produce podcasts for other people. Um, uh, one of them is uh, Tumul Vision, which I think a lot of people here would be interested. You should check it out. Um, sorry, I'm nervous enough so I'm not typing properly. Um, and uh, it's good stuff, a lot about uh, the social web, to where technology meets people and culture, and we, I'd love to get a digital humanist on sometime. Um, the problem is, when I get to my own projects, you get results like this. Coming soon, watch this space for new writing and a new podcast in early December. So of course, that was written in September of last year. Um, so. Why, do, what, why am I bringing this to you? Well, I, I think that uh, there's a real possibility here to bring um, the power of podcasting to help highlight some of the cool stuff that you people do. Um, I'm sure we're all fans of the digital campus, uh, and I'm sure a lot of people here do things like watch Leo Laporte's Twit Network, or have <coughs> ventured into Dan Benjamin's kind of one-man show, Five by Five, uh, his network, which, oh, which I missed. Um, what I want to do is a humanities fan uh, version of this kind of thing, a series of podcasts, a mini one-man podcast network, but with a lot of guests, focusing on different topics, and uh, bring in a little dash of boing-boing for some uh, blogging touch. Uh, I want this to be a place where people can talk about research, exhibits, ideas and discuss them with a smart general audience. And you can hold me accountable and make sure I do it by uh, checking in with me on Twitter or something. Thank you. I'm Katie Tolbert. I'm with WikiDC, which is the soon-to-be official Wikimedia chapter for the DC region. And I'm also a GLAM ambassador, which stands for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, and can include like historical societies and other organizations. And we help facilitate collaborations between them and Wikipedians. And here in DC, like this summer, like we have uh, two Wikipedians in residence, aka like they're like summer interns and they're embedded at, one is at the Smithsonian's Archives of American Art and the other at, at the National Archives. So um, Dominic, our Wikipedian resident at NARA this past week, he got 
has said of high resolution Ansel Adams photographs uploaded and previously they only had low resolution scans, so we got these uploaded and used on Wikipedia, so we have like a brand new article. Like nice photograph. And also like we're focusing on like, I mean like improving articles related to like documents that, that they have and one of my pet projects, which has been going on for almost a year and related, is a wiki project, Fedflix. So, like, a group of volunteers go to uh, the archives and like, digitize, like, DVDs or videos that they have, put them on the internet archives, and, like, some of them are huge files, but I'm working on getting them over to Wikipedia and, and used, and it also, like, it's more than the archives, like, the Department of Defense, like, any like public domain video like you take and upload and so I think I'm just about out of time. Let's see if this works. Yeah, so like this is one about um, it's probably no sound but it's the Wapiti or the elk of Jacksonville, Wyoming. It was um, filmed in nineteen thirty nine and now it's on Wikipedia and we can use it. you're familiar with nines. Uh, all right, so I went down to the Caribbean, to the Caribbean Tourist Association. I'm a Caribbean uh, scholar myself. Uh, for a week, to propose to them uh, the possibility of a Caribbean nines, or a Caribbean version of, of nines, where we bring together the digital archives and digital projects of the Caribbean in one place where scholars can use it. But what became evident to me when I was down there is the infrastructure is lacking. There is no energy because there is no young digital humanists. Uh, working on Caribbean studies right now. Some of you have heard some discussions about problems and diversity in digital humanities. Well, there's things that we need to do on all sides of the board, both uh, scholars coming from uh, marginal places, uh, uh, from marginal places in the within the academy, but also from us. So one of the things that I wanted to propose to you is to come talk to me, let's start thinking about bringing some of that knowledge that we have to the Caribbean, generate some energy amongst them in a dead <coughs> camp. Now. Uh, if we plan it right, we probably can get some peach and sun too, which is an incentive. I mean, I don't know if you noticed, know but I, I'm burning here. So uh, come talk to me if you're interested. Oh, great. And hit me up at info at that camp. Yeah, we're going to we'll talk. Thank you. Yay. have organized that camps or have helped to organize that camps, my brief announcement is we have stickers for you and we just want to recognize you. So pray for everybody who's ever organized that camp. Okay. Well, we've already given these out to a number of people who have organized this particular that camp, including, and I would love you to tweet this, Andy Prive, P-R-I-V-E-E, -E, or B E E, um, who's not here today, but Jenny Rodriguez, one N, who have done a great deal to make this um, terrific event. Um, so um, they are going to be getting these and probably something else. But if you, anybody who's ever organized a that camp, Ethan Wittrell, I'm looking at you, or helped to organize a that camp, some Southeasters, maybe Brian Crossall, come up here and get your sticker. Brian, you get a sticker. Come on. Woo! Yes! yes. <laughs> Take these stickers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the chat somewhere else? that camp um, and get one of these stickers, um, you should write me at info at thatcamp.org. There's a great deal of information on thatcamp.org. We have a Google Doc uh, that has a registry to where you can sign up um, to hold your that camp and I'm there to help with all kinds of um, advice, documentation, and, and so forth. Um, thank you all very much. I hope you had a good lunch time. I'll put the schedule up so that we can see where we're going next. And by the way, I did post um, the sessions outside the rooms as well. I might even type those up for tomorrow. So stay
stay here if you're interested in Unpress. Can I say really quick? Yeah. There was interest in learning how to write a WordPress theme from scratch. I'm going to go find a room and we'll do that at 4 o'clock. You'll close it down there?